Welcome to This Week in Federal Taxes for the week of March the 28th, 2016. And this week, we've got a number of interesting things to talk about. First, we've got delays this week, but you're probably going to like the delays we've got. We also have a case that tells us about how details and timing matter when we look at charitable contributions and how they're dealt with. We have a really good pair of excuses someone had for why their horse business didn't make money, but the court still didn't buy it. And we also had the IRS this week making revisions to the procedures for referrals of cases to appeals once a taxpayer turns to the tax court. So we're going to take a look at it this week in current federal tax developments for the week of March the 28th, 2016. Current federal tax developments are brought to you by your state society of CPAs and all the state societies of CPAs and Nichols Patrick CP Incorporated. Make sure that you take a look at your state society offerings as we come up here past the 15th, coming up shortly, actually this year, the 18th, and we'll start taking a look at what we're going to end up working with with continuing education for this year. You'll have to make your course choices. Remember your state societies and also take a look at the courses that we'll be offering you here at Nichols Patrick uh, for your live courses with the various states. Now let's move forward and take a look at what this week's cases are going to be. And we're going to start out with a case that deals with a issue of charitable contributions. This is the case of French versus Commissioner Tax Court Memorandum Decision 2016-53. It was issued on March the 23rd of this week. And we have a taxpayer here who made a charitable contribution of a conservation easement. Now, to be quite honest, I suspect there are reasons why the court might have preferred not to delve into that contribution because they tend to get messy for other reasons. If you've looked at other cases with conservation easements and some of the ways taxpayers have gotten that wrong. But in this case, the court didn't even have to look at the issue about whether the taxpayer had an ownership interest in the item they transferred or whether it had been properly valued, because it turns out the taxpayer fouled up on something far more fundamental. In this particular case, the taxpayer filed, actually it appears from the facts of the case, both an original return and then a later amended return were filed before April 15th of the year in question. Now, at that point in time, the taxpayer had a deed that evidenced the transfer in late December of the prior year that the transfer of the conservation easement had taken place. But they didn't actually have a letter from the organization acknowledging receipt of the item and noting that nothing was received in exchange for the contribution until June of that year. That presents a problem for us because for taxpayers, the basic rule you need to remember is for any contribution in excess of $250, a taxpayer must have a contemporaneous acknowledgement of the contribution that contains a description of what was given, also when it was given, and finally, whether anything was given in exchange for the contribution and if it was a value of what was given. So our problem here becomes that by the date the return was filed, and this is by the date the return's filed, this is not something you can fix after the fact. By that date, the only thing they had was the deed. Now that's not necessarily too bad in this case because as the tax court noted and the taxpayer pointed out, there have been cases in the past where the tax court has allowed, even though the they didn't have a letter from the charity stating nothing was received, when they had given an easement, if the deed in question contains all necessary information, the deed has served as a documentation. The cases the taxpayers were looking at were cases like Averitt versus Commissioner, which is a tax court memorandum decision 2012-198, and Simmons versus Commissioner, tax court memorandum decision 2009-208, which was affirmed on appeal by the D.C. Circuit. But the catch, the catch in this case was the court found that this deed didn't provide the information. In the two cases I just mentioned, the deed stated that it represented the full agreement between the parties. And it never, st- even though it didn't state nothing was given in exchange for the contribution, the reality was it didn't list anything as being given. And since that was listed as being the total agreement between the parties, the taxpayers essentially were given the credit for having documentation that they'd received nothing in exchange for giving the gift. In this particular case, the deed did not contain that language, that this was the entirety of the agreement between the parties. The taxpayer said, but tax court, in another case, you went back and looked at the fact a taxpayer who had that documentation, you looked at the fact they really received something, 
and you threw it out. So obviously we can consider facts after the date. The court said, sorry, guys, that's the other way of looking at it. Obviously, if your document is in error, the fact that you receive something is still an issue for the IRS can raise. But the reverse of that doesn't hold true. You can't go back and reconstruct this. The reality is we've seen this problem in a number of cases before. In fact, if some of you may remember from a couple of years ago, the case of Durden versus Commissioner, Tax Court Memorandum Decision 2012-140, where a taxpayer lost nearly a $25,000 cash contribution to a church because the church acknowledgement did not have that little line about nothing of value was received in exchange for this contribution. The fact that they, again, as in this case, they received an acknowledgement after the fact, after the date, actually in Durden, it was during the exam, they got the acknowledgement from the church that simply updated the letter, still didn't qualify deductions laws. This is a case where details seriously matter. So the tax court decided that even though the IRS was disputing where they owned the property and the IRS was disputing whether, in fact, the value of the contribution was correct, the court said, well, we don't really need to worry about any of that stuff because reality is even if they own the property, even if the valuation is perfect, they didn't meet the documentation requirements, they can't get a deduction. The other interesting item to note in this case that you should take a look at is they weren't really challenging the year of the contribution. That year had already closed for IRS assessments, but the contribution had been large enough to create a charitable contribution carryover that went forward into two succeeding years. Those two succeeding years were what were under exam. So this is another case to remind us again, and I mentioned this a number of times before, that what is closed, when you talk about a year being closed, is the IRS being assessed, being able to assess tax against that year. It does not mean anything factual in that year that would have an impact carried forward on later years cannot be challenged. In this case, the actual fact and detail of that contribution for the closed year was open for exam on the years into which it carried over. And the other practical thing to notice in this case is the IRS went after that particular contribution and the tax court was fine with throwing it out. So they actually got the benefit the first year because the IRS was late to the game, but they lost the benefit of the carryover years. Important little details to keep track of as we go forward into these in these cases. Next up, we're going to take a look at the case of Kaiser versus Commissioner, Tax Court Summary Opinion 2016-13. This is a hobby loss case. And like most hobby loss cases, you can you understand how this tends to work up. Taxpayer has lots of income from her main business, and taxpayer has this other business off to the side. As all too often is true in these hobby lot cases, the particular issue in this case was that her side business was horses. She was going to train horses. So she and she had skills in the area. So it was not that she was not able to do it. She had the background, but she also had always owned horses. So she wants to train horses. And as not surprisingly, we tend to have year after year of losses from the horse operation. That also is a fact pattern we almost always see in these cases. So she essentially lost money and lost significant money every year. But she had some reasons for this. When she first got ready to start the business, shortly after she started up the business, she was involved in a serious auto accident. That serious auto accident effectively rendered her unable to perform the training for four years. So she was ready to start this business. She was you know, ready to get going. She had a horse to train. It was her own foal. So she, went, she wanted to train the horse and suddenly she was injured. She was seriously injured and it took four years for her to recover. At the end of that time, she decided to try to start up again. And apparently this woman has really bad luck with automobiles because she's involved in a second serious automobile accident that again renders her unable to train horses. And in fact, she never was able to come back and actually train the horses. So she converted the business at that point to a website and she was posting pictures of horses to educate kids about animals. So she's posting pictures of her horses and her goats, et cetera. And she had 15,000 pictures. Her sister-in-law was writing articles for the site. And she told the court that she expected here in this year, 2016, that the site would be able to finally start generating money, about $100,000, she believed. 
Again, I'm not sure I understand how this site was going to generate that level of money. And in fact, if you can generate that simply from writing about horses, I probably need to start a different site than the one I have talking about taxes, because clearly that's far more profitable to do the horses. But the court found problems here. Yes. Okay. She looks like she has a sympathetic case, but here's the problem. The court said, nevertheless, we don't see any evidence that you ever actually did something here that indicated you intended to make a profit. We saw no business plan. We saw no basic records for this. We understand about your auto accidents, but we note that you still managed to run and you know, actively involved or were involved in your financial planning and insurance business for all those years and made significant money from them. But the horse business kind of just got ignored during that period. Nevertheless, you continue to claim the losses. So the court said, despite the fact that you had these accidents and despite the fact that maybe that's a nice sympathy ploy, a sympathy case, and it probably was and probably is, the problem is you need something to indicate you intend to make a profit. The court believed that regardless of those accidents, she simply never truly intended to make the profit. So the court disallowed her losses from this activity. Next up. We're going to talk about some IRS delays. The first delay we're going to talk about here comes in announcement 2016-14. For those of you who are not aware, the IRS issued a brand new form 3115 last December. That's for changes of accounting method. This new form 3115 demands some additional information from you when you file it. And it's just, again, a different form. Now, it was issued late in December. So the IRS has decided, just now announced this week on the 24th, an announcement 2016-14, that they will go ahead and accept the December 2009 version of the form all the way through April 19th of 2016. So basically until one day past the individual filing deadline this year. I suspect part of that reason is twofold. Number one, any entity that was changing its accounting methods last year probably was developing its information and preparing to file with its return, the 3115 based on the December 2009 form. I say that's, that's possible. Now, I realize the draft was out of the new form quite early last year, but it's still very conceivable that some people, because it was draft, decided they were just going to work from the old one because who knows what they're going to change in the draft in the final form. Also, I would not be surprised to find out that at least some tax software that people have been working with and preparing corporate or partnership or individual returns with may still have the December 2009 version of that form, may not have updated it for the 15 version since it came out late last year. So what the IRS said was, we'll take those through April 19th. Also changed this year, right at the last, at the very end, of the period. And this is one of the things they did change in the final version of the form late, I should say, in the draft process. I believe we knew this before the final came out, but not long before the final came out, that they were going to stop sending the second copy for automatic changes to Ogden. And those Ogden items that we used to send copies of 3115s to Ogden for most automatic changes, those Ogden changes would now go to Covington, Kentucky, the IRS service center there. The IRS has announced that through, again, the same April 19th date for filing, they will accept either form filed at either address. So you could send a December 15 form to Ogden. That'll be fine. Or you can send a December 2009 form to Covington. That's also fine. Both will be accepted at both locations. Once December 19th goes by, though, if you file a form after that date, you must file it when Covington and you must use a new form 3115 as well. If the IRS guidance upon which you are relying to make an automatic change was issued last year, you know, re, let's say very recently, and it requires you to use the December 2015 form, then you have to use the December 2015 form. Generally, I look at it this way. If you can use a December 2015 form, it makes a lot of sense, especially at this late date, because if that return ends up on extension, you're going to have to swap over to December 15 to December 2015 form anyway. And we're sitting close enough to that April 19th date that it's very possible that something might arise with a return you think will be done and out by April the 18th 
that turns out not to happen. So the return gets on extension and then you're restarting. Secondly, you might as well get used to using that form. But if you have already got everything all set up on the December 2009 version, you can use that as long as you get that filed by December 19th. Or I should say by April 19th, not December. December is a revision time. If you get it filed by April 19th, you can use the 2009 version. After that, presumably, you will no longer have an automatic method change. And that would require you, therefore, to go back and ask for private letter ruling relief to make the change, which gets expensive. So make sure you use the right form. That's probably another reason to start using the, the December 15 form, just because you don't want to accidentally send out a 2009 version after the effective date. Also, another delay, this one a lot of people probably will like if it would affected you. Notice 21627 issued on the 23rd of this month. This is an extension of time to file the first 8971 forms. That was pushed back now to June 30th of 2016. This is the statement for the basis of assets received from a decedent for an estate where it was essentially a taxable estate that had to file a Form 706. Now, the history of this has been interesting. It became part of the law back in last July. July 31st, the president signed his, this bill and in, signed into law the bill that contained this provision. That bill literally said it applied to anything filed after the, after the date it was enacted. So any 706 filed after on or after August 1st. And secondly, that you had 30 days to respond and Congress didn't provide for any delayed effective date. So effectively, if you filed your 706 on August 1st, you are looking at having to get this form out by the end of the month. Had a couple of problems, of course, the form didn't exist. And uh, you had no guidance on how to do this. The IRS recognizing that issued a notice shortly thereafter that pushed the due date back to February into February, no earlier than that. Later, as we got close to that February date, the IRS issued a second notice that pushed the due date back to March 31st, a date which we're rapidly approaching. The IRS in February announced they were pushing that date back to March because they were waiting for the issuance of proposed regulations that would explain how to handle this thing. We had the instructions to the form, but we didn't actually have the regulations that explained in more detail what we were exactly looking at. Those proposed regulations came out the very beginning of March. AICPA and other organizations began complaining that essentially there wasn't time to incorporate and understand those rules. Also, as the AICPA pointed out, we're in the middle of tax season. So that really makes it a heavy strain on CPAs who are trying to handle compliance work in the income tax arena to have to sit back and make these detailed statements on the 8971 for basis and try to understand these rules that they didn't get till the 1st of March. The AICPA had asked for this date to be pushed back to May 31st. The IRS actually did us one better. They went ahead and said the first due date will now be June 30th. So any form 8971 is due 30 days after the 706 is filed but no earlier than June 30. That also applies to the copy of the statements, the Schedule A's, to be provided to the, to the heirs of the estate. Those also are pushed back to that same June 30 date. I would note, it seems unlikely we're going to get another extension since the IRS gave us one more month than the AICPA claimed we needed. So this time, I would suspect you need to get ready to file these in June. But the good news is you don't have to spend the next week scrambling to finalize these things if you had a 706 filed after June, July 31st last year. Now, remember, under the proposed regs, if you filed your 706 merely to make a portability election, but it wasn't otherwise required, you're not required to do this. There also are other cases you want to check the proposed regs for that tell you when you don't need to file this form. But if you haven't, if you have a situation where we've had a 706 filing, probably one of your things you want to do post taxes, if you haven't already done so, is go back and out and take a look with some time at the proposed regs and understand how you need to report this and get ready to file your reports there at the end of June. Next up, the IRS made changes to a 
procedures for docketed cases being referred back to appeals. This is Revenue Procedure 2016-22, issued on March 23rd. The IRS revised a revenue procedure that goes back 29 years, Revenue Procedure 8724. This governs what happens when a taxpayer files in tax court, the case gets to the chief counsel's office, and as most of you are aware, one of the things chief counsel's office normally does is sends the case back to appeals to have appeals try to settle the case without having to go to trial. This changes the procedure somewhat and updates them. Now, it's important if you're looking at this situation to take a look at this revenue procedure to understand when a case will be referred back. It does note certain cases will not be referred. It tells us about cases, for instance, where the notice of deficiency originated in appeals or the matter before the court originated at the appeals level. Not much reason to send it back there. They also tell you always the taxpayer can simply say, no, we don't want to go back to appeals. Kind of makes sense. If the taxpayer says, no, there's not a whole lot of point of sending the case to appeals because since it'll be a rather one-sided conversation. It also notes, as had been true before, if your case involves an issue that has been designated for litigation by the chief counsel's office, it will not be sent back to appeals. It also says that if cases otherwise where for good tax administration, we don't want to send a case back to appeals because we want some consistency, it's an important issue, even though we haven't yet designated it for litigation, then the chief counsel's office has the discretion not to send it back for appeals. The notice gives you the procedures, the expected time frames, and the level of control that appeals has for the case. Generally, appeals will have control to actually settle the cases in almost all situations where it's transferred under this rev proc, but the chief counsel's office retains the rights effectively to at any time yank it back, and there are fixed time frames when the case will be yanked back depending upon the type of case we're involved with. Generally, as we start getting close to trial, eventually you'll hit the point where the counsel's office will take the case back from appeals regardless of how things are going. So it talks about those matters of returning cases to the chief counsel's office. Again, if you deal with that, we have a taxpayer who's going to be, you're going to probably be working with the attorney here, but it does tell you about what's going to happen in that second try to get to appeals. So we'll make sure of that. This has been the current federal tax developments here for the week of, of shout for the week of March the 28th, 2016. For current federal tax developments, as always, is brought to you by your state society of CPAs and Nichols Patrick CPE. Be sure to join us next week on this broadcast. Also visit us at currentfederaltaxdevelopments.com. There you'll learn some things about the, you'll find that these citations we have for this week, as well as write-ups on these documents. And as we make changes during the week and as things happen during the week, we'll go ahead and post things there. Make sure you also check your state society of CPAs catalog for when we're going to have effectively the information on the site so that we'll have information on when we'll have the cases coming up and when we'll also put our courses on for you. And like I said, be sure to tune, tune back in next week and join us next week for more information here on the developments in the areas of federal taxes.